So welcome back to uh, MVP Podcast Season 3, Episode 5. Uh, we have Dennis here. Uh, thanks for giving us the time. Thanks for jumping on the call. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to talking about all the exciting things we're going to talk about over the next period of time. Yes, uh, we'll get down some rabbit holes. So we'll try to cycle it in and get back on topic, but we don't know where the conversation goes. Um, but we start the show the same way. So Dennis, can you give us a background of what took you and where your path took you to get to where you are right now in your career? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Dennis Stinson, and I get to lead the sales team at Fujitsu General America, which means that I'm vice president of sales for North America. So we get to say grace over United States, Canada, and the Caribbean. Um, so how I ended up here, I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Um, I started as a manufacturer's go representative. Go Birds, go Birds. We were going to get that. Absolutely. Uh, so I grew up outside of Philadelphia, uh, went to a school in Pennsylvania called Millersville University. Uh, met a pretty girl there, never left the area 30 some odd years later. Um, got into the manufacturer rep business, did that for uh, about 30 some odd years and had an opportunity to join Fujitsu. Uh, Fujitsu was always one of those shining stars on the hill in terms of the products that they brought, the industry that they uh, were in, and then also uh, really just how uh, the company was run. It's a good culture uh, at Fujitsu. Being a Japanese company, uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of good culture, uh, not to be overstated on where it is. Had the opportunity to come in as a regional sales manager, did a couple of things right, ended up as director of national accounts, did a couple of things right. Now I get to sit as uh, the vice president of sales. So it's a, it's a career that I'm not sure that uh, when I was 21 years old, graduating high school, where I was going to go, but uh, absolutely no regrets on the career and the path and the great individuals that I've met uh, throughout my last 30 some odd years in this industry. Yeah, it sounds exciting. And uh, so you worked your way up through that, that company is what it sounds like through the years. Yes. Yes. So um, uh, this is my eighth year with Fujitsu. Uh, so a couple of years in each spot and just, uh, just great company in a, in a very growing industry. And, uh, you know, so this is one of those rabbit holes that we're going to start down that oh, yeah. you know, when you take a look at uh, when you take a look at the industry that I'm in and HVAC and you take a look at the space that I'm in and that is heat pumps, you take pause and you see what's happening in the United States. And that is a tremendous investment in strategic electrification. So we're we're moving away from fossil fuels. And that's not a political thing. What that is, is 30 years of a national energy policy of not being dependent on foreign fuel sources. So that's moving us to more efficient cars, more efficient HVAC, building the electrical infrastructure. There's still much more to go, but nonetheless moving away from dependence on others for our very existence. And that's driving uh, strategic electrification. And to take care of home comfort, that means moving more and more towards heat pumps. Um, heat pumps technology has come light years from where it was 30 years ago. So now you can do a whole home comfortably and affordably with a heat pump. So as working for a manufacturer, that's, that's all we do is make heat pumps and being on the front end of inverter technology and all the geeky stuff, a really good seat to sit in right now is uh, to be talking about heat pumps and to be working for a manufacturer that makes heat pumps and selling them in the United States. It's a good place to be. Yeah. And, and obviously, like you said, not a not a political argument, just a re, uh, renewable energy source is something yeah. that would be a healthy thing to talk about as we're we're talking about whatever side of the fence you are on global warming or fossil fuels. Uh, any I mean, I've looked at um, solar power for my house because I mean, why not? If I could power it with the sun even slightly and it's I mean, there's so many programs now where it's free to install and it basically comes off of your bill. Like those type of things, those creative financing things, like why not look into it? I think yeah, it's absolutely new. And when we look at home comfort system, it's really governed by a couple of things, right? Number one, is it comfortable? If you put something in your home or in your property, it's not comfortable, you wasted your money. So mm -hmm. number one, it's got to be comfort. It's got to do what you bought it to do. And that's to make people cool when it's hot and make people warm when it's cold. So um, the best HVAC system is the one you never notice. Uh, so the first thing it's got to do is make you comfortable. And there's a lot of really uncomfortable ones out there. And then the second is, is that comfort has got to be affordable. So can I afford what it's going to take uh, to keep me comfortable in this house or this property or whatever it may be? Can I afford that to be able to do it? 
And if I can put a piece of equipment in that's even more efficient and keeps me comfortable, then I can save money by doing this. And then if there's a couple of bucks to incentivize me to go that way, it just really becomes, frankly, becomes a no brainer at that point on why you wouldn't do it. Yeah. And in my head, like you hit the first two things, the cost and, and can it make it actually comfortable um, or ease, I guess. And like, what I like is in our culture, because we have the system set up, we have the capability of then looking at that third tier and making it efficient. And I know that we've talked about high efficiency dryers and washers and fridges and dishwashers and obviously furnaces, but even the high efficiency furnaces, from what I know about ductless units, which it sounds like you're at, so much more efficient than a regular yes. furnace. Yeah. So, and that's a great, the second rabbit hole. The great conversation is, is that um, you look at where your energy use is used in a residential property and more than 40% of your home utility budget is spent on your HVAC. So if you address your home HVAC, a little bit of savings there is going to multiply out to a lot. You can change all the light bulbs and that's good. You should do that but the incremental effect is smaller compared to the percentage that the HVAC system, you take care of the HVAC, your domestic water and your refrigerator, you got it pretty well covered. You can change light bulbs at that point, that's great. But if you mm -hmm. do your HVAC, your domestic water production and your refrigerator, you, you've made some significant impacts to your utility bill. Yeah, and I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the biggest, hurdle for the ductless system is is getting it out there and getting it known like the marketing of it because as a builder uh when you go into building a new home it's you talk to the other contractor and they're like okay who are you going to use for your hvac and it goes to like the typical furnace unit and ductless isn't really spoken as a, a norm yet yeah so well, where you're... where are you at with your company in terms of getting some share and some talk about the ductless units going into these new builds? So great question. And you are 100% correct, is that when we go into new construction, we tend to do things the way that we've always done it. And that is, let's get, let's get uh, somebody uh, out here to run some duct work in this house. We'll put a single system in the basement or in the attic. We call that unitary. Uh, we'll stick an indoor unit and an outdoor unit in it. We'll take care of the whole house. Um, and that seems to be uh, pretty inexpensive way of doing it. Um, it is and it isn't. When we look at a traditional ductless system, and it's called ductless because it usually doesn't use duct work, the main difference is, is that we're taking the evaporator, the things that makes hot or cold, and we're putting it where it's being used as opposed to sticking it in the basement and pumping it throughout the house. So think about that for a minute. You take a piece of equipment, you stick it in the basement, then you run it through duct work, and it loses its heat or cold by the time it gets to where you want it to go. So yep. according to ASHRAE, and we should listen to ASHRAE, we lose up to 30% of our thermal efficiency by doing that. So you buy something that's 14 sear, it's 30% less efficient by the time it gets to where it is. Whereas a ductless product, we're sticking the evaporator at the point of use. So now when I say that I'm 33 sear, I'm delivered 33 sear because I'm in that room and doing it. So the, the scale of the efficiency goes through the roof. The second side of that is, is that I'm putting evaporators in areas of use. So I am zoning a house or I'm zoning a property. So now I don't have one thermostat downstairs. When I turn it on, the whole house is 72 degrees. I have a thermostat in each point of use. So if, if I'm watching the Eagles in the Super Bowl and I want it to be 72, I Good set plug. that thermostat. See how I worked that in there? But <laughs> if I'm upstairs in a bedroom and nobody's up there, I don't need that to be tempered. So I can, if I had kids off at school, I don't need to condition their rooms to the same temperature of the whole house. So merely by being able to zone the house, I make that comfortable, but I also gain the efficiency of not tempering rooms that I'm not gonna be in and have no intention of being in. Uh, so I get savings that way. The last of all that is, is that I'm an inverter. And what's really cool about all this, and I'll get a little geeky for a minute, but I take AC voltage, I convert it to DC voltage and I pulse it in through pulse modulation into the compressor and the fan motors. and I, I got all kinds of things going on. We really should charge a whole lot more for the equipment than what it does, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's ramping up and down. And what that really means is, is that that kilowatt of energy, I am squeaking the efficiency out of that um, by the way that I'm uh, producing heat 
and cooling out of that, that I can't get any more efficient than the way that I'm doing it. Um, so I am, my unit's running on cruise control. It's ramping up and down to match the need. It's not all on or all off. The best description of a traditional unitary system, it's like buying a radio without a volume control on it. So you just turn the switch on and it's full blast. And when you're done hearing it, you turn it off. A ductless inverter system is like buying a radio with a volume control. So you can turn it up or down to match exactly what you need uh, coming into it. So a whole lot of different layers of why it just makes sense. And if you get to tell that story in new construction, uh, the property owner says, I get it. Yeah. No, and I'm, I mean, I've looked into these units before and I want to say I looked up your company and uh, unfortunately in Wisconsin, we don't have any dealers. So my call to action is to get something up here in Wisconsin. Yeah, absolutely. That we can get this rolling. Because I, I like the unit. Obviously, efficient would be great um, to put into the market. Because I know that there's more people that are looking for how efficient can my my space be? Because um, cutting fluff is a big thing of, uh, I'm going to call it our revolution right now. Yes. It's to try and get things, cut the fluff, just give me what I need and and we're good. Yeah. Um, and that's, so one, that's one huge area of the home building. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's two conversations there. One is, um, so we all remember heat pumps back in the 80s. And I was that guy, right? My first home, I was going to save the world. I was going to put a heat pump in it. And I did. I put a heat pump in my house. And then I, I learned that once it got about 40 degrees outside, I wasn't saving anything um, because they didn't produce heat. And I learned a concept very quick of backup resistant electric that as soon as it got below 40, the heat pump couldn't extract heat from the outside to the inside. So I needed to go to electric heat, which was basically a hair dryer, a big hair dryer. And that got really expensive really quick. And I wasn't saving any money. And I hated heat pumps, although I lived with it for another 10 years. The technology has come a long, long way. Our system doesn't use any backup resistant electric because it doesn't need it. So if I take one of my pieces of equipment, the vast majority of my equipment can operate to minus 15 degrees at full output capacity. So if I take a 12,000 BTU, a one ton system, just a small unit, and go to minus 15 degrees, I put over 14,000 BTUs of heat out of it. So I put out more heat than I actually say that I'm going to wow. at minus 15. So there's many places in the United States at minus 15, you're pretty well covered. So the conversation is, is heat pumps don't heat that well. And I would say traditional unitary one system, yeah, you're right. You got to oversize it to get the heat out of it. Ductless heat pump is entirely different, entirely different animal because of that inverter technology. So um, it's a lot of heat output on that. Yeah. So and with talk, oh, so I'll, I'll let you go, Dan. Well, so I was going to ask, like, retrofitting is probably more costly than new construction, right? Because these units, no, I mean, don't you? No. Do, do you? Oh, go ahead. Where are these typically mounted? Would be the same as you would like vents, like above a window or below a window, or like what is? Yeah, so great question, Dan. So it, everybody knows us as that wall mount product, that thing that hangs on a wall, right? So it's rectangular, hangs on the wall. If you ever watch, you know, any of the HGTV shows and they go to Europe, you see them all over the walls, right? Um, we actually have five different styles. Okay. So I have, I have the wall mount product, which is by far the easiest. And the way the product works is I have an outdoor unit and then I run a pipe, two pipes and wire to the indoor unit. I drill a three and a half inch hole in the wall and then I connect it to the indoor unit that mounts on a wall. So all of my piping is outside. There's no duct work. Okay, so yeah, yeah. once I drill a three and a half inch hole, all the piping and wiring goes to the outdoor unit. If I have multiple units, I run multiple pipes. So pretty much the piping's on the outside of the house. We got, there's manufacturers of what's called slim duct or line hide. So it looks like downspout on the outside of the house. So if you're, if you're at the curb, it just looks like downspout. You really don't, if a contractor does a nice job, and most do, um, that you'll never know what's on the inside. But some people say, I don't really want that thing hanging on my wall. I have, you know, a historic home or whatever. I don't want that hanging on my wall. It doesn't but look I like for Instagram make... or Pinterest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I also have a ceiling cassette, which is a two by two grid. So if you want to stick that in the bedroom, you got an attic over top, I can do that. Okay. If you want a floor console. So if your house was heated with steam and you got radiators, you yank that out. This fits the same spot, uses the same holes and covers the same unpainted spot on the wall. It's perfect. It, it does nice. really well. Um, but then I also have ducted units. And I know I started saying that I'm ductless, but I also have ducted units. 
So I've got medium static, mid static, and high static. But at the end of the day, if you say, I would really rather have my house be grills and registers and diffusers, I'd really rather it look very traditional, then there's no reason why you can do that. Your ductwork's only two feet long. You yeah. can bring it in and blow it out the top and I stick it in the wall or closet and the ceiling. Um, or if you say, you know what, um, it's okay. I'm going to zone the upstairs. I'm going to do a ducted system. I'm going to do a unit in my master bedroom. And then I'm going to tie the kids' bedrooms and a hall bath together. Then I use a ducted unit to pick up those three rooms and do it in grills and registers and diffusers. So I don't want you and your listeners to think that it's only the wall mount product. It's by far the most popular, but there are a variety of different styles that you can make look very traditional and still get the benefits of efficiency and still get the benefits of zoning and still get the benefits of inverter technology. Yeah. And the reason I was looking into products, the ductless products is when I finished my house, I didn't run HVAC up to my attic, but I did end up finishing it. So it's, it's fully finished carpet, drywall. I got yep. awesome stained wood on the ceiling. I didn't run any duct work. I really cannot, I can't use the attic without some sort of temperature control for half of the year. Cause it's either way too hot and muggy or way too cold to even yep. go up there. Unless I have the little, floor mounted air conditioning unit that runs out the window. Yep. So I'm looking for a ductless unit up there, which would be super cool. Uh, as you were talking, you said that there are ones that you can hook into, to, you have duct units. Yep. Is that a unit that you can take out the old furnace and use the old ducts that are running throughout the house? I got that too. So that would okay. be a high static unit. So if you wanted to pull out, you got a gas furnace or an oil furnace, um, and you already have ductwork in the property and you know that to be good, um, then there's no reason why this couldn't be a drop in there for that. So you would have a horizontal draw through condenser. So a typical, typical ductless condenser, which is going to be inverter and do all the great things that we want it to do, but then have an indoor unit that looks very traditional. It looks like, looks like a refrigerator box, right? Small refrigerator box and would slide in right where the other one would go. The benefit of that is, is that you're going to a heat pump you go into high efficiency. And in most places in this country, you're probably going to get some type of incentive to do it because of its efficiency. So you can install today, you can install really high efficiency equipment cheaper than you can install standard equipment. The incentives are that robust. And once the IRA Act kicks in, um, it's going to be even more so. And that's going to take a little while and that's going to be different by state. It's, you know, it's... It's, it's complicated. There's a lot of layers to it. But at the end of the day, if you engage the right contractor, um, they'll know what's going on. We're coaching up our distributors and they're coaching up their contractors. So a good contractor knows what equipment qualifies for what. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's where I ended up stopping because I couldn't find a distributor in this area. And I thought like maybe I could pull one from Chicago being a bigger market, but I just yeah. don't know how far they travel. I don't, that's a landscape I got to find out more on. So I would tell you, this is going to be a cheap sales pitch, but I'm not above that. I would tell you to your listeners to go to our website at fujitsugeneral.com. And on there is a contractor locator. So you can enter your zip code or if you wait long enough, it'll determine where you are. It's a little creepy, but it does geolocate you. It'll tell you exactly where you are. And once it does that, it'll tell you the contractors that are nearest you. And again, there may be some rural areas where the nearest person is farther away than, than what you think. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, those are the people. And the people that are on our website, um, you only show up on our website if you've sat through some of our training classes. I cannot recommend somebody uh, that, uh, that I wouldn't want my own home. And what I want my own home is somebody that's got a couple installations or many installations under their belt and have sat through some professional training to make sure that the job's good. So yeah. go to our website, take a look at it, learn all about Ducklist. There's there's an eco rebate on there too. So you can go in there and uh, enter your zip code or again, it figures out where you are and it'll tell you all the rebates that where you're sitting, what rebates you would qualify for and what pieces of our equipment qualify for it. And then a click through on how to get the forms from your local utility. It really can't be easier than that. Well, yeah, well, we're going to add that website onto the show notes as well. Um, but one thing you said, if, if someone's creeped out about them knowing where you're located, all of those people that are creeped out, delete all your social media because it's worse Absolutely. than what's going on yeah. your website. Yeah, don't worry about the balloons. It's your phone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, 
apparently it, there was something going around and I didn't read it. So like, don't quote me on it, but apparently there was English writing all over the balloon. So okay. apparently that balloon was manufactured at some, some parts or something was manufactured in the U S I don't know. So there's something we manufacture in U S that we ship to China. That's newsworthy in and of itself. Isn't it? I know. I know <laughs> I wonder how much that cost. <laughs> um, so you said you had mentioned a minute ago about insulation possibly being cheaper than a typical HVAC unit. Would I hear that correctly? It can be. It depends on what you want to do. And again, right. that's a that's a broad statement. But right. every installation is different. And really, the best thing that anybody that's considered about doing some some work on their property is 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 know a good contractor. Um, so have the contractor come out and say, "What are my options? What makes sense here?" You yeah. know, I hear this nice guy from Philly talking about this ductless stuff. Is that an option for this property that I'm looking to renovate? Um, does that make sense here? And I'd love to tell you that I'm the best solution for everything in the world. Uh, there's going to be times when I'm not. Uh, so, but partnering with a good contractor that doesn't have a vested interest in anything other than doing the job right is the best thing to do. Yeah. And they're, they're more common than you'd think. Cause I, when I would go house hunting, you go into older homes that have that radiant heating. What you'll notice when you go look at those properties, you'll open up a closet door and you'll just see like a tube running down yep. or over a doorway, you'll see like a little circle coming out of the wall. And all that is, is the ductless unit that they, they didn't want to rip apart the old historic home. So they yep. put in the ductless unit, add the little circle, and that's where you get your heat from. So you will see it. You don't know what it is, but you'll see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a, there's a variety of different ones. You, yep, yeah, you're right. You're, there's a variety of different ones where we do really well is in areas where there's hydronics, whether it's radiant or baseboard heat or radiators. Yep. Uh, because by definition, you don't have air conditioning and air conditioning isn't considered a luxury anymore. Air conditioning is considered a necessity. So uh, yeah. anywhere there's hydronics we're in, uh, but also anywhere there's, um, you know, large petroleum, that's not easy anymore. Um, gas is getting expensive. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good solution. This probably so could you have helped my brother last of... summer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. He just paid nine thousand dollars, I think, for a new furnace, and I don't know if that included his central air unit or not. Yeah, yeah. But so what's happening in, um, you know, so there's two worry, ways to affect change, right? One is with a carrot, and one's with a stick, right? And when we look at our industry, there's the incentives to drive people towards efficiency, but there's also tremendous new regulations that are coming out into the marketplace. And it was just a couple of years ago that we saw the changes to water heaters and we saw water heater safety devices on natural gas units that bumped the price of domestic water heaters up significantly. A um, couple of years ago, we saw fan efficiency rating, what we call the fur ratings on air conditioners. So that jumped traditional PSC motors into ECM uh, motors. So our motor efficiency went jumped up. When you think about what runs on a furnace, the fan runs. So if you want to affect efficiency, you make sure that their fans are efficient. So that jumped everything up. Now we're changing the efficiency rating, our SEER ratings on how we're testing those. So we're going from an M standard to an M1. And what that basically means is all of our equipment effective January, uh, you know, 40 days ago, that all that landscape changed. So now that equipment had to get more efficient. And when we get to 2025, we're changing the refrigerant. The reason I bother spending any time talking about that is because we, when we enter introduced the FER ratings, the equipment cost went up to comply with it. When we went to the M1 standards, the equipment cost went up to comply with it. Ductless products always met that. When they came out with fan efficiency rating, big deal. With, the, with everything we have meet that. Yeah. When they came out with the M1 standard, okay, big deal. You're you're looking for something to be 14 and a half sear. My minimum is 18 sear. This is this is not a problem for me to do. Yeah. So when we talk about the difference in pricing, Yes, our equipment at one time was more expensive to do, but the other stuff has caught up for it to meet the minimum efficiency ratings. The, the cost difference between it is not much, if, if much at all now, if any at all, uh, simply because the other stuff to meet the requirements, uh, the, the overall cost has increased. Yeah, and that's a good place to sit when you're already miles ahead of where the regulatory standards are. Yeah. You guys yeah. can sit back and, and watch the other people panic to try and meet it. Yeah, I wish we were sitting back. We're not, but yes. <laughs> you're, still, you're still pushing. I know you are physically. But, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, 
the, the, we are the fastest growing market of the HVAC. So when we look at the segment that we're in, we're still a small percentage of what the overall volume is. Um, it's, a, it's a $14 billion market. Uh, so we're still a smaller percentage of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it is the fastest growing and has been the fastest growing for the last 15 years. Yeah. And I, I do see it continuing to grow, which is awesome. Um, I had a question on, all right, so you covered the installation, obviously maintenance and repair is the other side of the coin of, okay, yes, maybe it's cheaper to put in, but Dennis, what about repairs? Like, I'm sure that's a pushback you get from clients. Well, I, it, we do and we don't. So what you, what we really do, um, so a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, we know that in all product categories, you get three segments, right? You get a destination brand, you get a mid-tier brand, you get a value brand. Uh, yeah. We position ourselves as a destination brand. And what that means is, is that we've got the highest quality. Uh, that means that our dealer network or our contractor network are earned. So they invest in training, they invest in uh, all the things needed to not just sales, sales is a small part of it. It's really how do you put it in and keep it in is what we have to invest their time in. So when somebody installs our piece of equipment today, if it's one of our lead contractors, out of the box, our product carries a seven and five warranty, seven year uh, compressor, five year parts. If you register in 60 days, it goes to 10 and 10. And if an elite contractor puts it in our best of our best, it goes to 12 and 12. So the warranty on the product is 12 years. So any That's parts great. are covered inside of that for 12 years. Um, what we also do is coach up our contractors on how to maintain and how to coach them or, or how to uh, repair them. So we have mobile apps uh, for them to be able to get out there and read the troubleshooting codes. We have hands-on training classes for them to be able to do it. So I'm going to tell you, we have our count, our human count in the United States, half of it's in the technical service side as opposed to the sales side. So we, we dedicate considerable resources on the backside uh, so that it goes in and stays in and it's reliable on to do it. But it really comes down to contractors investing in time and giving them the resources to be really, really good. Repair and service of products is a non-issue for us because we hit it up front. We require it to happen. Uh, great investment in material. And it all starts with good quality stuff. I'm not the cheapest, but I am the best value. Yeah. And I'm assuming there's no like seasonable tune-ups. Like every year you have to have H back out to tune up your air conditioning. And then, well, and there is, summer. there is. I mean, okay. anything mechanical requires maintenance to it, right? So it's okay. not a set it and forget a piece of equipment. Uh, it's moving a lot of air, air is dirty. Uh, yep. So there's going to be things that you need to do. But again, I think that's that, that conversation where you find some, a contractor that you create a business relationship with, right? And yeah. then once a year they come out and they tune up your system. Remember that we're talking heat transfer here. So if you've got dirt, debris, and grime, and a lot of it is cleaning. If you got dirt and debris and, and grime uh, encompassing your heat exchanger, you're not exchanging the heat the way you would want to. So you can affect comfort, but you're definitely going to affect efficiency. So I would argue for the hundred and a half bucks that you're going to spend for somebody to come out and clean it, if it's once a year, every other year, and if you get a good contractor, he'll tell you, you know what, let me come every other year because it's not worth it. Um, but it may be you need to see me every year. Um, but what you spend for them to do that, you're going to regain in the efficiency and the yep. comfort's going to be going to be the icing on the cake. Yeah, take care yeah. of the equipment. And it's going to be the same thing if you get a, a typical furnace. You're I, going to have that twice, there is no, twice a there year. There is no HVAC system that um, there's no motor car you drive. There's no HVAC system uh, that you never have to touch again in your life. So if you're, yeah. if you're thinking you're never going to spend a dime on maintenance, you're going to spend money on replacement then. Yeah. Yeah. And you had, uh, you went through the whole breakdown of your warranty. Uh, one question that I always ask is transferable. Is that staying with the property or is that with owner or does it depend on the situation? I guess. Our warranty today is for the original owner. Okay. Is, um, we haven't gone down the avenue of transferability and it really hasn't been that big of an issue for us. Um, that being said, there are extended warranties out in the marketplace that can be purchased. Um, we recently went down a new avenue. We're working with a company called uh, uh, Service First Financial, and it's actually a leasing of the equipment. So now oh, nice. as a property owner, you're leasing the equipment. It's a set monthly payment. And if it ever stops, it includes all service, all maintenance, all parts. So it's uh, 
kind of like your cable bill, you know, that it's a, a fixed amount. If it ever stops making heating or cooling, um, then you've got it covered. It's part of your monthly fee. Yeah. And you see that all like on the agent side, uh, the one thing that we always see appear is uh, water softeners. Yes. Or reverse osmosis, those systems rented from yep. one of the four big players up here. Um, yeah, they'd be a good not, guest on your show. Yeah. yeah, it's not a very like uncommon thing to see with those equipments being rented at all. No. So if you take a piece of equipment and you lease it for 12 years, um, 12 years from now, I guarantee you that although I think I'm cutting edge technology today, 12 years from now, I'm going to see a, I'm going to seem a little bit antiquated and it's going to be the right time to change that over to the new thing. So the lease makes it really good. If you're buying it, then you're saying to yourself, well, I'm going to stretch it a couple of more years because I'm, you know, I'm in the free zone right now. Um, yeah. And that's when it starts nickel and diamond death. It's like driving a car over hundred thousand miles, right? You think you're winning, but you're really not. Yeah. Or like this, or like the iPhone cell phone trade in, right, Marcus? When your camera stops working and uh, <laughs> it's time to get a new phone. <laughs> that, that one hurt. Like that one hit home. Yeah, that one hurt. <laughs> I was trying to scan documents yesterday and I couldn't get my camera to work. It found a railing in the floor a couple times. That was frustrating. Yes, says the guy who's using an iPhone eight. Yes, <laughs> I'm on like the iPhone five. No, I'm very updated. I need to upgrade. Yeah, I, I hear do. you. I hear you. I do. <laughs> Um, so I, I mean, I, you don't have to convince me. I like the product, but I'm trying to say devil's advocate. Your system sounds awesome. Is there anything that it doesn't do that a typical HVAC would do? Cause you've got zoning down to the room, which is something a yes. furnace. I mean, I guess it could do, but you'd be paying. You could. It's an accessory to, the roof to do it. Yeah. It's an accessory to get it to zoned. It. it can, it can be done. Uh, yeah. You have, to have access to do it. It can be done. But yeah. it would cost a lot. It would be a lot of demo. If, if you're not doing it from the start, you'd have to rip through walls to get wires run. It would be chaotic. Yes. Um, the efficiencies up there, the maintenance is like, so is there anything that your unit can't do that a typical conventional HVAC system would provide? So your, your differences are, um, so if you're doing, if you're doing, how you're addressing air changes in your house are different. It doesn't mean that you can't do it, it just means that you're doing it differently. So we know that there's a lot of discussion about indoor air quality and what do we do with that? Well, we know that our unit's got uh, appropriate filters in it. We know that if you wanted to, you could put some UV lights in it. If you wanted to, you could That'd buy awesome. um, a different option of where you're putting a point of use uh, UV. Um, so there's a company called Fuel Control. They make a great product called a Duo, and they also make a Trio, and it's photocatalytic oxidation. Really, really good spot. There are options to be able to do it. If you're doing air changes in your house, you can build that into a traditional ducted system, or what's very, very common now is using the bath ventilation fans. Panasonic makes some great stuff uh, to where they're using the exhaust fan in the bathrooms on timers to be able to get the appropriate air changes in a property. So um, some are used to building that into an HVAC system because I'm mounted on a wall and really don't have access to the outside, even though I run the pipes out there, I'm really not pulling in fresh air. Um, then you would uh, look for some other way of doing it. Now, if you're using one of my ducted ones or my ceiling cassette, I do have a fresh air inlet built directly into those. So the air would come in from the outside, be treated and then dispersed. But our most common product, a wall mount product, um, you would need to look at another form of fresh air. And fresh air is a good idea, um, but I would look at the uh, bathroom ventilation fan to do that. It'll do the same thing, do it really well. And it's very common now. A couple of years ago, that would have been a challenge. Today, you're probably hard pressed not to find an IAQ bathroom ventilator. Yeah. And we've used the bath fans for circulation for HVAC when we're restoring a, a spot. It just depends on the electrician running it to the right switch that it turns on and it meets code and all that stuff. Yep. But I found inspectors don't, uh, they don't frown upon it, but they don't like it because it's different. It's different from what they're used to. Well, it's um, an education piece, right? So it's yeah. uh, you're used to it pulling air out, not introducing air in. When you think of fresh air, you're thinking of air coming in. And if that's created negative, how can air come in? So it's a, it's a, it's an education piece. Yeah. And I leave that for the HVAC guys because that educational piece, I'm not 
I'm not licensed in and I don't know numbers to run on doing right. those calcs. But um, yeah, the, the circulation is a big one, but it sounds like you've got that system down. I would think a little bit better if you're introducing uh, the UV light as a, a cleaner on top of the filter. Yeah, so there's there's options to do that. I like the standalone stuff too. I like the idea. I like the idea that some things are meant to do specific tasks. I like that. Um, you know, yeah. I never was a fan of the built-in TV VCR. I think that they're two different things. <laughs> so I look at my HVAC the same way. That if I want if I want heat and cool air, I have something dedicated to do that. If I want my indoor air quality. I can invest in something. And again, there's some, there's some products out there. Fuel controls comes to mind. There's many, um, but they monitor the quality of the indoor air and then cycle based on what they're reading. So there's really good technology that is much, much better than what you can build into an HVAC system. And I think the benefits of zoning and efficiency outweigh um, any disadvantages of having a, a different dedicated piece of equipment. But I'd argue that that equipment's better than what you can stick there, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I had I had another thought earlier about um, liquid propane because obviously in rural areas they don't have the typical gas line that you can hook up. And I mean, I had a cabin up north that worked just off of liquid propane. Is that something that your unit can work with? No, we're electric okay. altogether, so we're one hundred percent. Oh, electric. it's all electric. One hundred percent electric. So awesome. So we're so we're a heat pump, right? So, I mean, we're, we're back to that sixth grade physics, you know, where we take the three different states of matter, where we take, you know, um, liquid, solid, and gas, and you change temperature or pressure to change the status of it. So by moving refrigerant around the system, we are compressing it. When you compress it, you exhaust heat. When you expand it, you absorb heat. So a heat pump, all it does, and I make it sound really simple, but all it does is take heat from one area and pump it to another. So in the winter time, we are expanding the gas outside. We're collecting the heat from outside. And you can collect heat from 18 degree air or zero degree air. There's heat in it, just doesn't feel like it, but you can take the heat out of that. We move it to the inside and then distribute to the inside. Air conditioning is not something that makes cold. It's something that makes the absence of heat. So what it does is it collects the heat on the inside, takes it outside. So a heat pump is just an air conditioner that works both ways. A heat, an air conditioner just takes heat from the inside, puts it to the outside. Yeah. I was watching a Netflix documentary on, uh, I think it was like the best 100 inventions of, from like the 1950s to the 2000s. And one of them on there was the air conditioner. Apparently it was invented by a guy who did- uh, Carrier. Carrier. Yeah, he was a, a mail carrier, right? Or newspaper. Well, his, his last name was Carrier. I forget oh. whether it was Joseph or Charles or we called Chuck. It, I would, but it was a guy named Carrier. You know the big blue oval Carrier. Yeah, uh, he's the guy that in, that invented air conditioning yeah. Interesting. or commercial air conditioning. Yeah. And there was something about he did he did print like newspaper or letters or something, but he couldn't get the dye to dry in the climate that he was in. So he hired some engineer, some smart guy, to try and figure out how to control air. And that's the whole birth of HVAC and- I didn't know uh, that story. I'm going to reuse it. It's a great story. But I knew that he, uh, I knew that he basically invented it, made it commercially viable. And yeah. but it's really just, you know, again, it's, it's sixth grade physics. It's liquid, solid, and gas. And when you change from one to the other, it takes energy to do it. And part of that energy is heat. So yeah. you can make heat or extract heat. So it's pretty basic stuff when you think about it. Yeah. No, it is very cool. Uh, where do you see uh, the next step in the U.S.? Because I feel, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, Japan and the in the U.S. I think are infrastructurally built a little bit different. Where I think the, yes. Japan can, they're more on this front of electrical uh, power. And I might be mistaken, but I believe they have a highway, uh, a small portion of their highway that has solar panels it may very well be so uh i didn't see it but it may very well be i would tell you that the united states is different than the rest of the world we know that sometimes we take a lot of pride in that but we are different from the rest of the world the rest of the world go back to that conversation that there's two ways to affect change carrot and stick yeah the rest of the world doesn't pay what we pay for electricity it is downright cheap here 
you know, when you're in a landlocked country and you are trying to develop electricity and you're paying 38 or 40 cents or 50 cents a kilowatt hour, all of a sudden efficiency and zoning is the only thing you want to talk about. You would never stick a system in the basement and run ductwork to the house and waste that energy because it's so expensive and so precious to do. Yeah. Um, you're also looking at overall cost and materials and the whole nine yards. So the vast majority of the world does not heat and cool like we do. Um, the vast majority of the world does not use a unitary system with ductwork. We are the one spot in the world that uses ductwork because our energy sources are relatively cheap. We get upset when our gas goes to three dollars a gallon. That's not expensive in the in the scheme of the world. We get upset when our electricity goes to a dollar fifty, um, you know, a, a kilowatt, and we get all bent out of shape out of it. The reality is that that's a downright bargain for the rest of the world. So, so the world is much farther ahead of us in terms of efficiency, and whether that's making domestic water or that's making air conditioning or whether that's making heating, we're we lag behind only because we've really not had to have the, the push to have to do anything different. Why change if you don't have to? Yeah. And do you think that's the main reason of why things haven't changed or there isn't as fast of a growth in this field? And I don't want to well, make it like a political thing, but no, well, I would tell you that over the last over the last 15 years, more things have changed in the last 10 years in this industry than they probably changed in the last 40 years. Uh, so we look at the continued change in um, in the type of fuels that we're going with, and certainly big mandates for, for change and efficiency. And that's driven by, you know, our national energy policy. And that started really back in the 70s. I mean, when, you know, for those of us that are old enough, remember waiting in line to buy fuel based on your license plate, you know, the whole miracle movie, the whole nine yards, that was real for some of us. We well, I haven't heard about this one. Yet. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, this has been a national energy policy for decades through all administrations. It's not a political thing, just why do we have to buy our fuel from somebody else when we can do things better? Um, so that's been driving slowly along, moving along. And now we're seeing some resources come back in on that. We're watching our natural resources get more and more expensive. So this kind of makes sense to, to do things differently. Is it going to make sense for everybody to go to electricity? No, but it makes sense for more to go there than are there now. Um, yeah. So we can be able to, to go down that avenue. Where I see things going and where the industry going is where we're now starting to combine our mechanicals. So you're going to see um, domestic water working in conjunction with the HVAC system. You'll see domestic water being heat pump water heaters, but heat pump water heaters maybe being tied to your HVAC system. So if I'm taking, if I'm taking the heat out of the upstairs bedroom, instead of dumping it outside, why don't I stick it in the domestic water? So okay. where we see heat recovery products now, we're gonna see more and more of that become mainstream coming into it. So in the summertime, when I am heating my pool, why don't I take uh, the cooling from somewhere and put it in my pool? And in the wintertime, why don't I, you know, so at any one time between my domestic water, my house, my pool, some of my other things, something's hot that wants to be cold, something's cold that wants to be hot. So instead of making that, why don't I just move it around? Yeah, I like that. I mean, you already made the dinner. You might as well eat all the food rather than throw it in the garbage. You got it. You got I it. I like that. Yep. I like that. And you mentioned there's, it makes sense for some and not for other, obviously it's, it's per case basis, but as a property owner who does rentals, I eliminate gas as much as I can because right. gas means boom. And I don't want my tenants to deal with it. So I do electric stoves. I would probably prefer to eat off of a gas, but in a rental electric makes more sense. Are these units something that would be easy enough for the normal renter who doesn't want anything different, they're obviously renting because they don't want to own a home. So they want a plug and play unit, something easy enough for them to get in, hit the thermostat, understand how it works and just roll with it. Yeah. So today the equipment is set up. Um, so in terms of a renter liking it, I don't have to tell you, but the overall cost, the monthly cost is how you value it. So if you have an antiquated HVAC system in there and it's costing them 400 bucks to heat mm -hmm. or cool, then you can't charge as much per month. I mean, it's that, that property is only worth yep. so much in totality per month. So isn't it better that the vast majority of it goes to those who's honing the note on the property instead of those that are running the gas or electric into it? So um, the better the efficient piece of equipment, the better return you can get on your uh, monthly charge for them to live there. 
Um, yeah. You know, so when we take a look at the at the property, that standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. The equipment in and of itself can be controlled in a lot of different ways. Um, you can it, it'll ship with a wall mount thermostat. It's either wired or wireless. But if you want to dial it into an app so you can change the temperature in your property anywhere in the world, as long as there's Wi-Fi at the property, you can do that. We can tie into Google and Alexa and you can yell at your equipment and it'll turn up and down. <laughs> um, so we even tie into an app called Ift which is if this, then that, which is really cool. So if it gets a certain temperature outside, it'll change change the temperature and your Sonos will play White Christmas and your garage door will open and it'll tell you you need milk and all that kind of fun stuff. So there's a lot of really great technology. But at the end of the day, if you want to turn it on and off and go up and down, we got that. If you want to control it from anywhere in the world and do all the G-Wiz stuff, we plug right into that. That's fine too. Yeah, and that I could see for those out-of-state investors who aren't on their properties, uh, we just had somebody on that has an Airbnb and I'm thinking if I own an Airbnb 10 States away and it's vacant, like, it'd be nice to go on my phone and be like, Hey, make sure that this is not going below 50 degrees. Absolutely. So my pipes burst. Or that, or that, you know, I've got, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a VRBO or whatever. I'm on a short term rental and I'm changing over. Um, what's to say the person that walked out the door didn't crack it, crank it up to 85 and I'm now, yep. so where I am, I can adjust it. I can set schedules. Uh, I can do what I want to do. I can also verify that the heating is actually on. I probably have a camera on the outside. So I know when they leave, so I can also see what's going on on the inside. I would tell you that we've introduced some cloud-based technology. We have our own cloud. And, uh, so we do some residential stuff when we do some commercial stuff there. When you look at commercial properties, there's just some great dashboards that you can look at multiple properties at the same time on there. So let's go yeah. right down the avenue of, of what, what your listeners are doing. Yeah. And I could see it being useful in apartment complexes and all that. You can zone it per unit uh, and yeah. know what's going on. That would and there's be a so level useful. of troubleshooting. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a level of troubleshooting too. So if you had a, a trusted uh, contractor somewhere, you could give them access so they could see what the fault codes are prior to going out there so they could roll out with the solution instead of. So as an investor, then now you got a service charge, not a yep. diagnostic and a service charge. You've, you know, you're, you're, and trust me, your contractors will like the idea that they don't have to be gophers for three hours a day. Yes. Yep. And I mean, you try to mitigate that as much as you can. Like I've gone down to a unit and called the HVAC guy. Cause I was like, Hey, I know it's going to cost you 250 bucks just to come out and read this thing. So can I do it for you? And I'll tell you what code pops up so that you only have right. to do one trip. But I mean, I have to pay myself to do that. Like it would be nice right. to go on the phone and just have that all done. Yep. So that, that is, is a major, major cost savings. Yep. And like you said, your contractor will love you for it. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're, no, they're, they're happy not to be stuck on the highway picking up a part. Oh yeah. Um, and you alluded to the transfer of energy a little bit ago. How far or how close are we on the horizon with all of that? Is that like just introduced onto the floor? Or are we, are you guys working on actually implementing that system in? No, so those products are available in other parts of the world. Um, we have a big refrigerant change coming here in 2025. Um, so we are in the United States, we're changing our refrigerants uh, to match the, um, um, Toyota protocol. So what that means is that we're reducing our global, global warming potential below 750 on our refrigerants. So there's a pretty significant change in our equipment coming in 2025. And to be able okay. to meet that demand, we're doing that now and you'll see the equipment start rolling in next year. Um, you'll see some new equipment, some new innovative things coming into the market. And I just came back from Atlanta, which our, our big show, big HVAC show was there. Um, and we saw some of that equipment there. You'll see more of that once the refrigerant change comes in, because anything you do now, you got to completely change 18 months from now. And um, nobody's got that kind of engineering time, to be perfectly honest with you. After just changing efficiency, now change in refrigerant, um, you introduce what we have to introduce. But if you don't meet regulations, you can't sell. So you got yep. to make sure you meet the rules first. Yeah. And there's been subtle changes that have been felt already. I know that some units, the Freon that it uses isn't allowed anymore. So Correct. If you have and that's old... the refrigerant changes. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to ask, is that what's changing with the fridges now? So those are all going to be up to the next standard where the yeah. fridge used now is no longer going to be even needed. I don't know. It... 
Yeah, so I mean, we, we saw some time ago where we went from Freon, R22 to R410A had a glo smaller global warming potential. And then the next step is in 2025 when we drop below 750. And that's going to take us into R32 or 454B. The industry is kind of splitting on which way they're going. And there's reasons for that, you know, really well beyond what we need to talk about. But there's reasons why some are going one way and some are going on another. But nonetheless, it's a change and it reacts differently. So that means that the equipment, the compressors are different, the tube diameter is different, heat exchangers are different. So the equipment is fundamentally different. It's not just getting a new can and sticking this new stuff in there. It's the equipment yeah. is entirely different. Yeah. And you were talking about, was it an R rating? A SEER rating. A SEER rating. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure. You'd mentioned something if, and I didn't know the numbers. So, so SEER, SEER is Seasonal Energy Efficiency Rating, and that rates residential air conditioning. Okay. Um, so today, the requirement is air conditioning sold in the South, consider the Mason-Dixon line to be the delineation, and it basically is. Everything below that, it's got to be 14 or better. Everything above that, it's got to be 13 or better. The South has a higher dependency and more year-round on air conditioning, so you would want the higher standard there. We passed into M1, which is came effect in January. And what that means is, is that the equipment is now rated to a higher standard. So it's addressing variable speed motors and it's doing a lot of good things. It's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. But yeah. now there's the SEER 2 rating. So basically everything that was 14 SEER, if it were on the same scale, would have to be about 14 and a half SEER. Um, so so the equipment fundamentally is changing. So either you take higher efficiency equipment and retest it and re-rate it, that's the term that we're using, or you redesigned it. Some redesigned, some re-rated, but nonetheless, the piece of equipment you had yesterday is not the equipment you can use today. To make it even more complicated, and why wouldn't we? In the South, <laughs> everything was by an install date. So what you could sell and install on December 31st is not the same equipment you can sell and install on January 1st. In the North, it was all based off of, is all based on manufacturing date. So as long as you made it by December 31st, you can sell it in perpetuity in the North. Okay. So you have all of this equipment that all of a sudden became doorstops in the South, that's flooding to the North. So if your listeners are South of the Mason-Dixon, their equipment cost, they should have, they should have made this decision two months ago, um, but their equipment costs just jumped up because they have to go to the new standard. If you're in the north, you may not get you may not get the picture that you pointed at, but you're going to get a really good piece of equipment. So maybe it's slightly different color or shape or size. We're working through that inventory in the north. Okay. But again, ductless, we met all those requirements. Nothing changed. I have a new sticker on my box. That's the only difference. My equipment passed right through. Really meant nothing. But on traditional unitary, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people that are that are not sleeping well at night based on where that equipment's got to go and where it could be sold. Yeah. No, and I, I'm excited to see the changes and I, I hopefully I can introduce that into some of these rentals um, that I have coming up because I mean, everything about it screams like it's a good idea and that's where we're headed anyway. So I might as well jump on the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Reach out, we'll find the right way to do it. And then you can do a good test job and a testimonial on, I did this on this side of the street and that on that side of the street. And these are the results I have. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it'll be better because I mean, that's always a, a question you get when you are looking for a new unit or the tenants coming in, how much is rent? What does it usually cost in heat? What is the water bill? Yep. Like those are all things that I, I have sit, I've set out printed year out reports that I can send They're to them. Ask. Say, yeah, absolutely. This is what you were looking for. So if those numbers could drop for them and drop for me, like that just screams a win-win. Yep. So what I was, I was going to ask two things. Um, Back to Marcus's question earlier, you you mentioned how like when you're doing new construction, how are you guys trying to change that conversation or what are you guys doing, whether it's with marketing or with the agents or the home builders to be part of that conversation to promote your product as opposed to a traditional duck list? Because I mean, obviously there might be like under the table... Um, relationships where it's like, Hey, if you're building this house, make sure you mention carrier, for example, or whatever the other brands, how do you get into that conversation? So we get in that great question. So, um, we get into that conversation, the old fashioned way is that we go out to job sites and we find out who's doing the work. 
Um, then from that, once you find them, you know the type of work that they do. And we have the conversation with builders and developers. And it really comes down to bringing the right contractor in that has faith and confidence that they can do it well and do it right. We do a couple of layout jobs. And once they see that they work fine, uh, then it tends to blossom and grow out of there. Um, you know, builders have got a tough job. They do. Yep. Um, you know, they're worried everything about a roof, the siding, the air conditioning, the faucets, the landscaping, to, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And there is a level of, if it's not broke, why do I want to fix what's not broke? What, what, what's the benefit for me to do? Um, when we're now seeing a lot of the incentive packages that are coming down, um, that can also be used by builders and not just replacements. Now we're seeing some incentives that are driving that behavior. And once you try it and realize, well, it really didn't cost me any more to do it. And my people that are buying a house are looking at this as a premium because it's zoning and efficient and all these other things. Um, you know, I'm going to move this forward, but it takes, it takes legend, it's carrot or a stick to make people change what they're doing. And yeah. um, so we got a couple of those things, but it is, it is really word of mouth. We advertise like crazy. Uh, but at the end of the day, when was the last time you saw an ad for HVAC? You probably see one every day, but unless you're looking for it, you don't think about it. So we're yeah. going out there in the grassroots and uh, having those conversations. Yeah. yeah that, I, I, mean, that, I feel that, like that would be, Oh, sorry, sorry. You're good. You're good. Good. I was going to say it, it is hard as a builder. Like Dan was alluding to, like you have those relationships like, Oh, Bob takes my HVAC stuff. I always work with Bob. I know, but what does Bob bring And sometimes the general contractors or the subs that are going to bring them in kind of get offended when you push back on it. But I mean, there's a question there and everything is negotiable. So I have to ask the question. And if you get upset that I'm asking the question, I don't think we're going to have a very good relationship anyways, but it takes that either the homeowner to ask the question or the contractor to bring up, Hey, there is another option. And yeah. do you want to learn about that? Like education. That's the yeah. first thing I see is education. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, so somebody has got to be able to try it and, and get the comfort level with it. That's really what it's all about is getting the comfort level. Um, it, as a contractor, and I understand that business very well, as a contractor, if you're mentioning, if you're proposing to do something different than what they've already done, then you own that at that point. But if I'm putting in what you asked for, well, if it's not hot or cold, that's, I gave you what you asked for. So there's a yeah. little bit of that going on there too. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we are making significant strides down that avenue. Uh, part of that was when we introduced the, um, the high static product. So part of that is, is do heat pumps really work? There really is this whole big thing in the United States, the heat pumps really work. And the answer is the good ones do. Um, so uh, it's getting the confidence of the builder that I can heat and cool this property entirely with the heat pump. Um, and now, okay, well, if that makes sense, then why don't I start looking at zoning? So you have some of the some of the very forward thinking builders that are saying, I understand heat pumps. Yep. The good ones work. And I do understand zoning. There's a great value in that. And that's something that I can sell. I can monetize that. I can get value out of that. So yeah, my, my mindset only because it's part of my past experience with certain jobs and it's always networking for me. Um, so like when you talk about like home efficiency, uh, on your end, right. And, you know, cost per use, things like that. I used to sell led lighting and I used to be in the national sure. accounts. And if there's a way for you to, to develop partnerships or like, Hey, I'm aware of this new construction, new, whether it's commercial residential, blah, blah, blah. We just sold this led package to them. Do you guys have that? We're like, scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. Hey, make, make sure you mention that we can provide, you know, um, the heat pump in yeah, so we do a, we do a lot of different things uh, down that avenue, and it's whether we're we're partnered with somebody else. Um, a lot of our partnerships tend to be down the energy energy modeling side, uh, so that's where we do really really well is uh, partnering with energy modelers that are going into accounts, and whether that is a housing authority, whether that is a builder, um, that's going in and saying, let's do an overall package here. So let's do the lighting, let's do the appliances, let's do the domestic water, let's do the HVAC. Um, we're doing business with a lot of companies that are now uh, effectively leasing the product to uh, the, the end user, um, where they're um, putting the equipment in there, then assuming the utility bills and charging a fee and making their money off of the difference of what it was to what it is. 
so there's a lot of different there's a lot of different models out there now based off of and I guess there was were there but based off of uh, efficient equipment going into a property. But yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're working with the builders, we're working with the hospitality people, um, and yeah, it, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. Yeah, that yeah, model the- seems like what the the solar panels are. You make yes. your you make your money off the difference of what it was rather than what it is. And after 20 years, you pay it off and now you're you're fully solar. Everybody wins. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Everybody wins. And, I'm I'm less than what I was yesterday. And if yep. anything ever goes wrong, it's your fault. Um, yeah. and if I'm really good at doing what I'm doing and I'm using uh, good equipment, then there's a there's a delta T in there that I can make some money off of. So yeah, yeah, we we work with quite a few of those and it's it's a really good business model. A lot of private equity money there. Really good business model. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, you were mentioning the companies that you work with. And I'm I'm asking because I'm hoping for this answer. Are these companies newer companies or are you getting HVAC, the Bobs of the world who've been doing it for 30 years to understand like this is a new technology that's coming, learn something new, expand your business, introduce this option? Because I see it as like an Uber taxi. Like taxis didn't develop and didn't move on with the times. And here comes Uber. All they did was create an app. And now they're bigger than what taxi could have been when they had the fleet and the the knowledge of, I mean, the roads. I would tell you, I would tell you that our client base is all over the place. Um, So knowing how we go to market, we go to market exclusively through wholesale distribution. So we sell our product to a wholesale distributor who sells it to a contractor who installs it. we would be nothing without our distributors. So our distributors uh, are our advocates in a marketplace. They create the relationship with our contractors, our dealers, if you will, downstream. Um, but they're also coaching their people up on technical support. They're having the parts. They're just they're just a great one-stop shop. And they're also putting all the other parts and pieces together for me to sell. I sell the equipment, but I don't sell the wire. I don't sell the pipe. I don't sell the insulation. I don't sell the pad. I don't sell the disconnect. I don't sell all the other stuff that goes with it. So a distributor puts all that together, represents my interests really well. So when you ask what does the typical profile of my customer look like, and I say there's not, um, yeah. that can be the young guy that's driving efficiency that's, that says, I never want to put another boiler again in my life. Um, I want to do this kind of stuff. That's him. But that's also the older fellow. And I'm careful how I say that because I'm in that demographics now. But I get that older guy that says, you know what? this is just a really good solution. This is a really good solution for my customer. Most contractors don't consider themselves salespeople and they get offended when they do consider themselves salespeople. I'm a consultative sales. I do what's right for my customer. I'm not trying to push them down the avenue of something they don't need or want. I'm in the comfort business and I'm going to give them the best recommendation. So it's our job to show them where the wins are with our product, where the quicksand is, but also where the wins are as well so that you can win, you can make money, your customer's happy. They refer you to their niece and nephew and coworker and, and that's how it works. So it's, it's, it's gaining the confidence and that really comes from really good distribution and we got it. Yeah. We had that same situation with LED lighting. So when you're bringing that up, it's, it's all too familiar with right. using distributor exactly. reps and, you know, hey, yeah, then they're the ones that deal with the contractor or the, the electric supply uh, houses and they're, yeah, so. That's our model. Yeah, so okay. it works. It I works. understand. Yeah, so how do we get in contact with your wholesaler to get these uh, wholesale prices on units? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have two, I have two furnaces, two central airs, and I think they're probably pushing twelve to fifteen years old each. I told Marcus in our first episode I had to replace the capacitors in both the central airs because they went out. One one went out early June, and then like two or three weeks later, the other unit had that capacitor go out, and I I swapped them myself, but. I'm dreading the time and the hit to my pocketbook when I have to either replace one or both furnaces if and or central capacitors go, and that means your compressors draw on some amps, which means that you're closer to the end than you are to the beginning. So right. it's a good time. To start. Ooh, your, doomsday. Your capacitor, your capacitor is your warning call. Right. <laughs> is what yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, our website for, for those that aren't going to do their own work, uh, the website is our place, which is general.com is the best place to go to locate a contractor. There's a bunch of choices on there. Yep. And as always, you should talk to more than one. And as always, you should try to find an HVAC contractor, an electrician, an exterior guy, and a landscaper before you need them. So you should have that relationship before 
it's the middle of the night you and the guy on the back of the phone book looks like the most attractive guy. It's probably not. So or whoever that answers person that you trap, right, <laughs> right. whoever can be there in an hour yeah. may not be the right person you want. Could be. Um, there was actually, I was listening to a podcast and they said, if you want to find and you want to build relationships with good contractors, go sit at home Depot at 5. AM. And anybody that walks in the door, ask them what they do. And you'll find a contractor who's on the ball. Cause if your contractor is going in and starting his day at five, they probably have their ducks in, the, in their, in order. Yeah. Which I might, I might say, go sit outside of an electrical supplier, sit outside of a plumbing supplier. Uh, you know, I, yeah, whatever. But well, for, right. for stay individual, out the source of material. Yes. Right. Yes. For individual areas, go to different areas. They were yes. talking on the building side. Like if you want, some, if you want a new kitchen, yeah, like, you want a deck? Go see who's humping yeah. the lumber out at five in the morning. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's kind that's of what it. they're alluding to. So yeah, if you're looking for lighting or plumbing, <clears throat> go to the plumbing house or the lighting house, and and you'll find that contractor. So we, uh, I'm based out of Philadelphia. Uh, Jersey Shore is not nearby. Um, Darn. Family's got some property down the shore. And a lot of that is rental down there, um, which is good, right? That's all, that's all great. Uh, what you tend to find is that there's contractors that specialize in rental properties. And what I mean by that is, is that they understand the business unit. What they understand is, is that there's time of the year that you do maintenance and there's time of the year that you do emergency and you just kind of balance it all out. So you understand that when a property owner calls you and says, the heating or air conditioning down because they got tenants in there and they're down there for a week and they need air conditioning. By the time they come back from the beach, it's got to be fixed. So they, you know, they, they figure that out. So the nature of your business, I would say, find somebody that understands the profession that you're in and understands that you are working in a rental situation. And there are, um, it's not a matter of I'll deal with it. It's a matter of, I can't deal with it. I have a tenant. I have a higher responsibility. So find somebody that understands that model and it'll work really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously check out your website for those, those folks, uh, as a yep. step one, at least. Yep. Yep. Find Good people the area. Good and stuff. Do you, see, you see that network growing as, as things get implemented and you guys grow stronger. So it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So keep I got, checking. I got at nationwide, I got more than 10,000 contractors on there. So, um, um, I think I'm pretty good. Yeah, no, that's a positive positive note and where you guys are sitting so yeah congratulations yeah. on where you've taken it and i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing what's new and what's coming absolutely you ever get to the east coast come and see us uh we got a place in manhattan we're based out of pinebrook new jersey so if you ever get to the east coast come and see us we'd love to show you more about our stuff and uh for your listeners check out our website um there's some great info there and i got a lot of local resources as well so we can help your listeners we can help you so thank you appreciate That's it awesome and we'll tie your website and all your contact uh, information. What, what's the best way to contact you? Or is it just to go to the website and look for the distributor? Go through the website. We've got an info box there. And awesome. from there, we can, uh, uh, based on how that comes in, we can get, I can get one of my people on it. I can get one of our reps on it. I can push it to a distributor or contractor. You know, based on, if it's an emergency, yeah. we want a contractor there. If it's, uh, if, it's, if it's a what if, then let's get the right people out there that got the vision to, to take a look at it. Yeah. Very cool. No, that's awesome. We'll put that in the show notes uh, so that people have questions, can get a hold of uh, you or whoever needs to be to get it answered. Not him directly. He's 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 a higher up man. He doesn't take care of that oh, stuff. Yeah. Not um, always happy to take phone calls. <laughs> just not happy to put my email address. I'll right. No. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. We get that. <laughs> no, cool. that all works. Well, I yeah. appreciate the time and thank you for the knowledge. It's awesome. Um, I love the technology. I I'm looking forward to this growing bigger and bigger. So fantastic. Keep uh, and we'll we'll be looking out on the the Midwest at least. You got it. Great podcast, man. Thanks for the invitation. Thank Thanks you. for the time, I Dennis. Learned it. a lot today. Thank you very much. Bye. Now. Bye.